Welcome then to all of you to the Pago United Baptist Church. We thank God for your presence and invoke his blessing upon you as we share together in his precious, precious word. I said this to you in time past. When you go to see your doctor, what do you expect him to do when he listens to your chest and does various examinations and finds that you have quite some problem? Should he pat you on your back and say, you are all right, just go home and rest, take a few Tylenol and you'll be fine? When you discover your chest is rotting and he ignore that, we we'll say, thank you, doctor, for making me feel good when I was really bad. No, you won't. It may not be pleasant to be told this is the problem. But the good thing is, when you know the problem, you begin to tackle it head on. What's the relevance of what I am saying? When you come to worship on a Sunday morning like this and listen to your minister, what do you expect? To hear that word about it, you can say, ah, now that fits my mother, that fits my brother, that my cousin, this my neighbor, but there is nothing in there for me. That's most unfortunate if it should turn out that way. Because the reason you come to listen to your minister is that you might find something in there for you. Be it something that lifts you up, rebukes you, but something that says, that's about me. I remember some instance, I was speaking at the Chita Pig and I were attending a theological school. And at the end of the service, this doctor friend of ours comes and says to me, Hey, how is it that you entered our bedroom? I said, what are you talking about? My, my, my wife and I say, at the end of the service, who is it that went and whispered to this man what was happening between us? And when I heard that, for me that was heartwarming. Because you see, God reads our hearts. And when we come into the house of worship, we come to this God who has read our hearts. And if the minister has listened to him, there should be something that comes from him that touches my heart so that you tell me, that's for me, that's meant for me. If you should go out, because it's difficult. I mean, we have different needs that are represented by different people, admittedly. But what is the point of coming to the house of worship and find there's nothing for me? And if we really came and said, God, I want something. I long to hear you. I long to be ministered to. I want nothing, genuinely nothing. There was a big problem there. If you should go out and genuinely say, that was meant for me. Thank God. If it was meant for you, then go on and so I'll do it. Look around you. Are there people in this house you admire? When you look at them, so far as you're concerned, you think they have all the money in their pockets and they can easily dish them out here and there. And somehow you feel like you should be the one in that position. You know, just, you know, no, anybody can cry to you because you are very readily available to help them. And as we saw last week, isn't that the boast of the world? We are the people. We are the ones. Because wealth is not an issue to us. While it is not a sin to be wealthy, to have money and material is not the end of the matter. Because while these things have benefit for now, 
they don't have benefit for internal welfare. And that is why it is important for us to realize that the real value, the real wealth that should characterize any person that any, has any sense of right feeling is actually that which is spiritual. So that even if we should have anything that is beneficial material-wise, we should see it in the light of how we may use it in a spiritual sense. How can that be? Well, we can worship God with our material possessions as well. But if all we are using it so that we may be seen for who we are, then something very grossly wrong there. But spiritual benefit, spiritual wealth, is for eternal blessing, as the text before us reveals. Let's just have a look. How can we spiritually benefit, and benefit not just for today, but forever? Well, we need to turn to God. Isn't that what the text in Isaiah is telling us? Isaiah is actually speaking to the people that have turned their backs against God. And they are God's own possession. And by the standards by which we count success in ministry, Isaiah was a very big failure. Because right now we count success in ministry by how many people come to listen to us, by how many people conform to what we are teaching. But Isaiah was largely a failure in that. Because only once is there a record of the fact that after his giving word, the man, the king, Hezekiah, hearken to the sound of his voice, did what he did, and God delivered the nation. Much of what spoke, he spoke, fell on deaf ears. And yet no writer in all of the Old Testament has written better stuff concerning God than Isaiah. And it is clear and easy to understand because this is the man who has the vision of God. He has the pre-incarnate Christ visualized in chapter 6. And he actually has this vision of this great God. And there he asks, when God asks, who shall I send? And he really says, I am ready. After seeing your majesty, and to see you stoop so low as to ask me to be in your service, I am available. But God touches him. For he says, I am a man of unclean lips, who dwells in the land of unclean lips and clean people. And so touch me so that I may go in the holiness of God and majesty of God. So it doesn't matter who repels him, who repulses him. He knows God has sent him and he will do it. And we have this fabulous book. He presents to us God in his beauty. This God who sees his people stray. This God who is in total control of all things. Who brings a servant, who is the savior, and who in the end brings glory to his own people. This is what Isaiah presents. Glorious stuff. <coughs> but the question is, can we join in and see that glory? Yes, we can, if we are ready to turn to God. And how can we turn to this God? Well, Isaiah presents, first of all, to us, an open invitation. See what he says. Come, come, ho, oh, come. Come ye, all of you, come. And this invitation comes to us in the opening seven verses. You come. It's not just you and you and you and you. It's all, anyone. You come, an open invitation. But that open invitation comes with an offer. Come and drink. Come and drink from the waters. Come and take freely. See, it's open and it's an offer to all. And with that offer, I want you to see there is an opportunity. An opportunity for each one of us. There is an opportunity for us to come to God. For he says, I'm not choosing one over against the other. The open invitation as Cheryl showed us is, God so loved, not just the Jews, not just the Greeks, but also the Africans and the Asians and the Americans, the Australians, the Europeans, not only the dark guys, the light guys, the pink guys, everybody, come. 
The invitation not to some, the opportunity is given not to some, it's given to all. And see the overwhelming nature of the, the whole offer, the open invitation, this great opportunity. He says, come, here's an abundance of blessing. He says, our God will freely pardon. And when he pardons, there is a whole wealth. When the Bible speaks of waters, it is talking about blessings that are immeasurable. The peacefulness, the abundance, the flow of life, the provision of endless goodness. That's what he's talking about. And that's all ours if we will turn to God. You know what our problem is as human beings? We regard ourselves as rational. We have the mind to think. And it is true, we've been given that mind. But our God is inviting us, not to our ways, he's inviting us to his ways. He's inviting us not to our provisions, he's inviting us to his provisions. Are we coming to us or we are coming to him? If there is any place where you can reason with God, Isaiah tells us, in the beginning of this book, come now, God speaking, let us reason together. Isaiah 118 says, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as white as wool. So, just is understand you can't save yourselves. You can't save one another. Understand that it is all rooted in God, not in yourselves. What is your confidence as you see there that it is well between God and you if you have that confidence? What is your assurance that you are accepted with God? What have you brought to Him by which you can say, See God, I've stepped it all, and you never can say, No. To me, what have you presented before him? God is saying, in yourself, nothing. The invitation is by himself. The offer is from himself. The opportunity is provided by himself. And the overwhelming blessing is himself. Where are you in love? Until you see him as your all in all. You're not there. How do you see me? Well, there is some proof regarding our turning to God. And the proof is in our thinking, the thoughts of God. And that's our second thought. And that appears now in the eighth verse, right down to the eleventh. For God says, well, my thoughts and not your thoughts. Neither are my ways, your ways. In other words, he's our God now saying, see, see how immeasurably big your God is. The God who says he's going to satisfy all of us, the God who's going to say he's going to fill us full, he can't be small, he must be big. Because God saying, come. You who are impossible, he is saying, come all of Canada, come all of the states, come all of China, come all of Russia, come everywhere, come. Come and eat freely. Come. And as you come and you see the immensity of your God, now soak yourselves, sink yourselves in the beauty, majesty, glory, splendor, mercy of this God, soaking it. And look at the example he gives as a rain falls from heaven and sucks the ground so that the ground becomes productive. So you do the same. If I've turned to God, now I'm going to say, what am I thinking, God? No! It's God. What are you saying to me? Let me think that. 
God, what are you saying to me? Let me be that. God, what are you saying to me? Let me do that. Is this who you are? You see, if the rain that's just pouring right now did not come, the ground would be barren, unproductive, dry, hard, useless. We may tramp on it, but we got the production of fruit, vegetation, vegetable, it will be useless. On the question I ask myself, if God's word is poured and falls upon human hearts, the way the rain falls from heaven and soaks the ground, how much are my thoughts, my feelings, my focus, my concentrations, my everything, how much are they soaked in God's word? How much are they soaked in the good things that are meant to be mine from God? I cannot be productive until I'm soaked in the things of God. And if I am soaked, here's the evidence that I am soaked, I shall surrender. Because if the ground chooses to be unproductive, here is what happens. It lets the wind blow and dries it up. And then it, it wilts the plant and it's unproductive. But the more it takes in water, that's why we say that the moment it dries up, we water it. And there's such a thing as irrigation when the rain is not there. Because the ground must be kept soft constantly. So that as it surrenders the surface, gives into the, to the wetness, the, the plant can now sink its roots. Where the hard soil was, it becomes soft. Now it becomes able to enter in and draw in nutrients and then just shoot up. Oh, it is growing. Because the soil is surrendering to the soil. It's being drenched, drained by the water. How much are we draining God of his utterances and being able to say, this is who I want to be. So that as we then surrender, here's what happens. We show forth growth by now not being the same people that we were before the word came into us. We become a different. Can you make a difference in your life between the moment you go into the Word and the period before you went into the Word? Mm -hmm. If you can't, isn't there something wrong? Because, I mean, we can see the difference between dry ground and wet ground. The dry ground is light in color. The wet ground is darker. The dry ground is unproductive. The wet ground is very productive. Where do we stand? How much do we see of God? How much do we soak in God? How much do we surrender to God? And then, because we do, we share in His ability to bring forth fruit. And that is why our last thought is let's thrill in God. For notice how now the, 12, the 11, 12, and 13th verses tell us. You see, where there was storm, there is now this beautiful tree. Where there was a problem, there is now this pleasure. In other words, we get filled with the pleasure of God. There will be joy. God had scattered these people and they had faced foreign nationals and they had trouble among themselves, but God was restoring them to a place where they could see that if they obeyed God, it didn't matter where they were, foreign land or their own land, they would be enjoying life. That is real prosperity, isn't it? And not only they enjoy life, they enjoy life where there is peace. For they are filled also with peace. How many of us don't enjoy peace? Oh, we all do. Who wants in a place where it's troubled all the time? But it is calm and pleasurable and pleasant where God is on it. And this is what we see happening. And we only see that pleasure and that pleasantness. 
we see the perseverance, the patience that comes there. Where there was thorn, it not happened one day. There is now this productive tree. Where was uselessness, there's now this use see the lapse. It's working its way right from what is unproductive into what is productive. Can you see the transformation in yourself? The thing that is giving off and leaving behind everything that breaks the heart of God and going on to that which blesses the heart of God? Can you see that development in your life? Oh, it's taking too long. It doesn't matter how long. As long as it's God's way, I will eat what is bad and take what is good. Is that happening in your life? And notice the perpetual blessing that comes with it. The flood of perpetual prosperity. For it says it's everlasting. That's how the text closes. God's blessings are not momentary. They are forever. What will you look for? Something that is momentary or something that is forever? Let me ask myself, what are those pleasures? What are those desires? What are those personal commitments that are keeping me away from God? What are they? That is stopping from being as obedient to God as like, what are they? If I am God, I don't want them. I want him who says, life that is rich and full is in himself. And it is rich and full. But you know what the problem is? I think, I feel, and I do as I want. That's the problem. Don't you do the same. That's a big problem. Let's come to this place where like this young lady who is working in a knitting mill and doing a lot of tapestry and so on and so forth. Who reads this placard on the wall? When you're in trouble with your weaving, call upon the supervisor. That's the best you can do. And as she's struggling, she's struggling. She realizes she has missed a knot and she tries to undo it. It becomes worse. She further tries, it becomes worse of steel. It becomes worse, she tries harder. In the end, she says, the supervisor comes and says, what have you just done? And say, yeah, I've intertwined my stuff. I failed to disentangle it. And then the supervisor says, what is written on the wall? He says, when you're in trouble, call upon the supervisor. He said, he said but I tried my best to help myself get out of the problem. The supervisor says, you did not do your best, you did your worst. Your best was to call upon the supervisor. How many times have you struggled and fought this <coughs> and and wanted to go your way when your supervisor, your savior, Jesus is waiting? Do you want to supervise yourself? Or you go to the actual supervisor, your savior, Jesus? What will you do? Uh, Father, we are thankful that you've not left us to ourselves. The abundance of blessing is ours in your son. Not just for the moment, but forever. He is there to answer our questions, all of them. To solve our problems. To dispel our wanderings and doubtings. To give us the assurance that it is safe to be in God. And there is no better harbor no better sanctuary, no better shelter, and no other rescue that is solid and sure by himself. May all of us anchor in him this morning by your gracious workings alone. And that is why our Father, we now have our be thy Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And let us not into temptation.